together again. Hope everybody had a great week. And um, what have we got going on today? Today we have uh, Maria is going to finish up, right? So I keep losing, yeah. So Maria is going to finish up her section. Um, and then Sandra is going to follow on with pipes. Yeah. Am I remembering correctly? Yep. yep. All right. Good. Um, <clears throat> so I, I think that the, uh, um, did anybody get a chance to, to use the Luber date stuff in this past week at all? I'm only asking because I did. Um, I used it a couple of times and it was very helpful. So um, I pulled up the cheat sheet because I couldn't remember everything, but um, so hopefully you guys did too. All right, I'll turn it over to you, Maria, then we will we'll just uh, take it off, take it from here. Let you go. Okay, sounds good. I'm gonna share my screen. Okay, you should be able to see it, right? Yeah. Okay, so today's icebreaker is to tell us something good about your day today. So whoever would like to start. You, why don't you start, Maria? I can start, yeah. Something about something good about my day was uh, having lunch with my husband. I really like that. <laughs> That's something very good. <laughs> That's nice. Right, do you both work from home or anything? Do you, does that not happen very much? Yeah, um, that doesn't happen very much because he's in the States and I'm in Ecuador. So whenever we get to you know, see each other and have lunch together is a nice thing. Yeah. Nice. That's nice. Um, I can go next. <clears throat> so here's something great that happened to me today. <clears throat> I had a, um, a, a problem I was trying to work out in R um, using the per package, which we haven't talked about yet. And which um, I, when I was studying it on my own, just hit a, a, a roadblock and could not get past it. And, <clears throat> but today I needed to work on it and, uh, and I had some, some questions about it. So I reached out to Colin on the Slack and asked him to help me out with it. And so we chatted back and forth for about 15 minutes or so. And he gave me the answer. I was able to solve the problem and now my results are perfect. I can do my presentation tomorrow and um and it was it was pretty amazing so i still don't really know what i did or <laughs> what it was that colin told me to do but um you know one of these weeks pretty soon we're going to go through that package and then we can we can break it down so that's what was good for me today i, I guess i could add on to that uh that'll be my good thing i guess because that was like the one thing that i saw today <laughs> so uh, I'm glad that it helped. Uh, I'll pass. I have a I have a blog post that talks about how I kind of did that. So, but yeah, that's my good thing too, because that was like the one thing that worked for me today. <laughs> and maybe if there's time at the end um, of the call, we can I'll show everybody what I was working on, and we'll see if it uh, if it'll get us ready for for iterations, which comes up in a couple weeks. So. It's useful for functions because it it uses a function, so. But yeah. I can go. I really like eating fish. So I look forward to eating baked fish every day. <laughs> okay. Oh, well, let me say that uh, I finish up my pipe presentation. It's not that it was difficult, but I'm using Yarigan and I had some issues. So it's more that uh, the how to is more the how than what. Yeah, so I think we can uh, get it started with the content. Okay, so 
Uh, today I'm going to finish the chapter on dates and times. And so the outline for today is to cover time spans. So the time spans are durations, periods, and intervals. And then I'm going to cover a little bit of time zones. So durations um, are one of the three times, time spans and they represent an exact number of seconds. So the key idea here is that this is going to always uh, give us an output that is going to be in seconds. And, and it, it, this is very useful when you want to get the difference between two dates. So for example, here, uh, I have to first uh, load the library, the Lubridate package. Um, so for example, if I take the difference between today and yesterday, so 2021, uh, April 13, and if I just um, do it in Bazar, this would be doing it in Bazar, then I get um, I get an output that says time difference of one day. So that would be the way to do it in Bazar. But if I want to use Lubridate, I can use um, the function as duration. And so this is going to give me a duration object and that is going to give me the number of seconds <clears throat> in one day. That is the difference between today and yesterday. Yeah. So the to better um, work with durations, there are different constructors. That's how the book calls them. And these are going to give you the duration of, of a, of, whatever you want to get the duration of. So for example, if you want to get the duration of, of one second, then you use the constructor D seconds. And that's going to give you the duration always. The, the output is going to be in seconds. So how many seconds are in one second? <clears throat> so then we can say, okay, how many seconds are in one minute. So here, because I want to use the minute here, then I have to use the function d minutes. And so on, you can do the same with hours. So how many seconds do I have in one hour, in one day, in one week, and in one year? And automatically it's going to try to um, uh, give you the duration in seconds, but also in the in the um, time in the time uh, ti the type of time the time unit that you are uh, asking it so another way in which you can use the constructors is not necessarily with just one uh, a vector of one so one object but you can also use a combination a vector a, a longer vector so you can say, okay, how many seconds do I have in one second and 15 seconds? And so you can use the concatenate um, function to give it a vector. Or you can also uh, use the, the um, a column if you want to get the, the number of seconds in, in zero to five minutes. So what it's going to do is if you do it this way, you provide a vector, it's going to give you the number of seconds in each of the, of the um, objects in the sequence that you give it. So here is the number of seconds in, one, in zero minutes, in one minute, two, three, four, and five, because that's, um, that's the vector that you provide. And so and finally, so one way to do that is with concatenate. Another way is to use the colon. And another way is to create a vector outside. So that's what I'm doing here. I create a vector outside. And then <clears throat> I use the construct the duration constructor, but now with the with the vector inside. And it's going to work just as well. It's going to give me the duration in seconds for each of the elements of the vector that I just provided. Now, the important thing here is that you can do many operations with this, um, with durations, and so that's very handy and very useful. So for example, here I have the number of seconds that I have in 15 seconds, 
and I can multiply that, that by two. And so that's an operation that I can do and I, I'm going to obtain with 30 seconds. Or I can say, okay, how many seconds do I have in 15 seconds and add three to that. And so um, this is, is again going to be the number of seconds. So I can keep going and, and um, not only use um, simple numbers that are outside of the, of the constructors, but I can use different constructors themselves. So I can use the number of seconds in one year plus the number of, of seconds in four weeks plus the number of seconds in seven days. The drawback here is that and you have to be careful because the durations, they only take into account the exact number of seconds. So these don't work with human times. And this is a little bit of um, hard to wrap your head around. But the key idea here is that there are things that we humans do, like the daylight saving time. And we also have leap years. And so those are human times, human constructs. And so whenever those happen, because we are working in durations with the exact number of seconds, does not the, the duration operations are going to ignore those human times. And so here, for an example, if I have uh, the date in, in 2016, when uh, the next day there was daylight saving time, so this is March 12, 2016. And so I create the, that object, no? Um, 1 p.m. of um, March 12, 2016. And if I just add the duration in days, that is going to be the number of seconds, is going to completely ignore that at the, at the next day, um, it was already daylight saving time. So, so what happened is, and uh, here you would expect that it would be 13 if it was not ignoring that. But because it ignored, it added the whole duration of, of seconds of one day. And so it added one hour. So that's the, the drawback of duration. So if you are interested in human times, um, then maybe duration is not the way to go. So does that that means then it it treats it like the number of seconds um, from one just the same time zone. It's just the number of seconds um, from wherever you are in the world, starting at that point, and then add on the number of seconds. It doesn't worry about time zones. It doesn't worry about daylight savings or leap years or anything like that. Is that exactly. Right? Okay. Exactly. It will just add seconds. So. Yeah. A hundred seconds, a hundred seconds, no yeah. matter what happened throughout that yeah. period. Mm -hmm. So another another time span that you can use is periods, so or are periods. So these work with human times. So if you are interested in human times, this is probably the way to go. And just as with um, durations. It, periods also have constructors. The difference here is that periods are not going to be preceded by a, by a D. So the, they don't have the, the D prefix. They only start um, with the, with the um, um, time unit. So for example, if I want to know how many seconds do I have in one second, then I can, I can just use the constructor. But as you go up, in the, in the hierarchy of time units. So for example, if I ask how many minutes I have in one minute, then I, I'm gonna get one minute and zero seconds. And then it's gonna be nested. So in the next one for hours, if I want to know how many hours do I have in one hour, then I get one hour, zero minutes, zero seconds. So you, here you can see a clear difference because with duration is the exact number of seconds and the output is going to be on seconds. But here, uh, is, it depends on the units that you, the time unit that you are asking it for. And it's going to be nested. So it's going to start with the, um, with the higher, I guess, the you know, bigger uh, time unit, 
and, and it's going to go down and give you the information about lower units, so minutes and seconds. And here you can see days is, is the same, weeks is the same. So here one week is going to be seven days, months uh, here is going to be the same, one month, zero days. So here something interesting is it doesn't go to weeks but to days and that makes sense. And years is the same, so it's going to start with one year, zero months. And, yeah. like, and do you know, for example, what will happen if we say hour one and a half? Uh, that's a good question. Uh, we can do that. Like like one and a half hours, like an hour and a half. So yes. What what? So yes, it just had to, uh, what mean uh, one month? And if we say one uh, dot two months, what does it mean? It is possible to say, it was just uh, just to understand if uh, you have to uh, to put uh, unit. Um, Integer, or we could put decimal and any, yeah. Yeah, let me see. <clears throat> so if I go here and um, <laughs> oh, yeah, sure. <laughs> okay, so you have to be integer. Okay. No, let me see. I want to make sure because. Uh, yeah, no, it has to be an integer. Okay. That's interesting. Yeah, that's interesting. Uh huh. Okay. Um, are you able to see the, the presentation? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so with periods, you can do operations just as you did with duration. So here you can add things, multiply things, and you can also use um, the, the constructors, combine the constructors. So here, uh, one thing to keep in mind um, is that when you add, it, it's important to, something where I was confused is what you are actually adding. Because here, for example, days five days right and then you add one it didn't actually add one day it added a second so you want to be careful with that and check because my expectation was that it was going to add a day but it added a second but here <laughs> i multiplied by five and it gave me you know, it multiplied the number of days. So you want to be careful when you do these operations um, and understand what you are actually adding, what time unit you are actually adding. And so um, for that reason, I thought that it was cleaner to use the, the, the constructors themselves, themselves because then you can add, specify which time units and how many of them you are actually adding. And so that's going to be more accurate. Yeah. Yeah, that seems like it would be super dangerous if you, just, <laughs> if you didn't know that. Yeah. If you, and you add five, like you add one or multiply by one, that's com two completely different, different uh, results, different yeah. applications. Okay. Good to know. <laughs> yeah. I'll mess that up at some point. Mm -hmm. And so now with periods, and you can see clearly the difference with durations here. Um, here you have the here you have the same example that we were looking at before about daylight saving time. So this was the date in 2016 when the when the next day uh, we enter in daylight saving time. So here, if you add a day in durations we saw that it completely ignored the daylight saving time um, happening, but here it doesn't ignore it. It takes into account the daylight saving time, leap year and human, human units. So that's something, if you are interested in human units, that periods are probably um, the way to go. And so the third time span that we can look into are intervals. 
and so intervals are different in that they have a starting and ending point. So here, um, this is important. If you are also, if you are consider, if you really have your starting point very specified, you know, very well specified, and your ending point very well specified, like your date. Um, and this is because sometimes if you just use periods or or durations. So for example, I'm using periods here. And because we have the leap years, and sometimes we have 366 days in a in a year, but sometimes 365. Then what happens is that um, Ari is just going to take the average. So <laughs> every four years is a leap year. So then if you divide the number of years um, by the number of days, it's going to tell you, okay, 365 and a quarter. <laughs> so, so, for, uh, so for things like this, you might want to, sometimes you might want to specify the, the interval, a specific interval um, that you have in mind. And so to do that, you are going to use um, the, the symbol. So uh, it's, um, it's like um, it's percentage, uh, hyphen, hyphen, percentage. And that's gonna tell you, okay, an interval is coming. And so from where to where? And so for example, here, this is an example from the book. So next year is gonna be today plus one year. And so if I if I set the interval uh, from today until the next year, what I'm gonna get is um, the 14th of April of 2021 until the 14th of April of 2022. And so now, because we are located in a in a in a very specific interval and we know when it started, when it ended, then it's easier for us uh, to understand. Okay, this is this is not a leap year. Therefore, um, if I divide by the number of days, then I get three hundred and sixty-five. So so that's important when you have a specific date, a starting point and ending point, then it, you're going to make it easier for R to, to really give you accurate uh, numbers. So that's when you would, would want to use it. So here's another example of how you can set the intervals. It's not necessarily that you can, that you have to use today or construct the date outside. You can use the helpers that we saw last week to construct your interval. So here I'm using the date of um, yesterday, so year, month, day, and you can use the helpers that we saw not yesterday, the, the week before, <laughs> and, and and use them to construct your interval. Yeah. So that's the time spans. That that's what I wanted to talk about the time spans. Um, now something that you want to take care of, um, be careful with, is that with intervals, you cannot use all of the operations. It's mostly just um, division. So in the, in difference, subtraction, adding, multiplication, no. You, you can just uh, do division. But with the other durations and periods, then you can do um, divisions. Uh, you can do divisions and multiplication and subtraction just as we saw. But with intervals, um, you only can do a division. Okay, so, wait. Uh, can, can, I, can I ask a question real quick about intervals? So on the intervals, the it looks like the output value is, it's, a, it, it's almost like it's a character stream. It's a date, and then it's two hyphens and then the, the other date. So yeah. it's kind of been like a number of the days between these these two dates or anything like that. It's so I'm trying to understand what the what's the the data type of the, of an interval. So my understanding is that the type of object is interval. So is is like a new type of object. Okay. Uh, 
yeah and and it gives you them and you can i even know that there's a function that is called interval so interval parentheses and you can put there the interval mm -hmm. uh, and that's gonna give you that creates the interval object um i had a hard time thinking about situations for me durations and and periods I, like i could see okay i could i could use this here and i could use this here um but other than than this type of division i couldn't think of a good of a situation where i might use intervals yeah. you know i had a hard time wrapping my head yeah. around that well and it's funny too that you can only do division on it too um like it it seems like it would make sense to say i have an interval of 20 days and i want to add five days to it and it should give you like the number 25 but anyway yeah i'm with you i can't i, I can't think of a good way or a common use for the intervals <laughs> But durations and, and periods, yes, for sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so the dreaded time zones. <laughs> it's time for time zones. So the first thing that you can do is to use the, the this function, this that time zone, and that's gonna give you the time zone where you are. So here clearly. <laughs> if I use this, I'm not in Guayaquil, but like it's in my country, that city is in my country. So it makes sense that it throws, okay, you are in Guayaquil. No, I'm not, but close, <laughs> close enough. <laughs> so, uh, but it's inter it, 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 it was interesting to me that it, it didn't throw me something like, you know, uh, Central Time or Texas or something like that, but Guayaquil. Uh, so if you want to know and, and you are trying to look into which time zone or how do I set the time zone, it's going to be very useful to know the list of time zones so that you can find the one, how the one that you want to set is called. And so for that, you can uh, look into the old zone names and that's going to tell you what are the time zones because and you are going to need that if you want to set the time zones to to something because <clears throat> no you can see that there's a pattern here where you have the name of the continent and a city but the pattern is is not always like that sometimes um there are cities that are not nested within a, a continent so if you think okay i can i can just go get away with putting the name of the continent slash the name of the city that i'm interested in that's not always going to work so it's it's, it's good practice to look into the also name so that you are sure that the time zone for the city that you're thinking of is going to work and so with time zones um here is an example for example of of a uh, time zones setting time zones from the book so if you create a daytime object you can specify the time zone and you can see that here um, we use the same day also names and here is for example an example where that rule of continent city doesn't work because specific Pacific is not a continent. So this is, for example, an example of where this might not work. Um, now, um, an important thing with time zones is that the, the value of them is mostly to, uh, to, for display, to have a display of that and, and to understand the time zone, but really so these three time, these three dates here, uh, even though they appear as different um, times, instants in time, because they are in different time zones, in the end, like back in the back end, uh, R is going to interpret them as the same instant in time, because they are the same instant in time. It's just that for display purposes, 
they are um, they are different because they are in different time zones. So on the back end, they are really the same instant in time. And that's going to be important if you are doing operations and subtractions and things like that, uh, because it is not going to be confused. Unless there's a, a mistake in the data. And if there's a mistake in the data, then you might want to change the time zones. And so there are two ways in which you can do this. You can change only the, the display. So this is only going to change a, which time zone it uses. So for example, um, X4, let's see what was X4. X4 is the combination of the of the three um, different times, different times, date times and time zones. So here you can change everything to to show you the time zone in the Australia and the Austral in this Lord Howe. I don't know if I'm mispronouncing it, but <laughs> in this city or place in Australia. So if you want everything to show in the in one time zone, you can do that by setting the time zone with this function with time zone, and then you're gonna get the display in the in the way that you want. And so, if we uh, investigate whether we change the instant in time of of those dates and times we are going to see that we didn't change the, the time. What we changed was only the display, whether we wanted to display them in that time zone. But we didn't actually change the time. But if you really want to change the instant in time, then you have to use this function, force tz. And then uh, you are going to change what you're telling R is Actually, your time zone was incorrect. This should be in 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 um, in the time zone of this city, and that's going to actually change the time, um, the instant in time. So now, if we check whether the time changed and whether there's a difference in the in the in the instant time, then you're gonna see that it changed because you actually changed the time. Um, to be compliant with that time zone. So. Yeah. So, so with TZ says um, to like show the same instance of time from the perspective of that time zone. Mm -hmm. And force TZ means use all of these different times and and move them to to the time zone that you specify, maybe. Yeah, move them exactly like move them to that time zone. Interesting. Not just display them, but it's like saying this was the wrong time zone. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah, time zones are pretty, are very tricky. <laughs> it seems like there's a lot of opportunity to to mess up, but also a lot of um, like a lot of versatility in what the package can do. Yeah, yeah. Um, so this is essentially um, the chapter of dates and times. Um, and yeah, um, I encourage you, I tried a couple of the exercises of Lubridate. So for in the R exercises, um, I can put in the chat. In the art exercises, uh, there, there were three different sets of exercises about dates and times. And all of them, each set of exercises had a, a range of things from intervals, time, time spans, but also dates and times, and also these last things. So it was pretty complete, I felt like. So if you are interested in getting more um, experience uh, working with these dates and times, those are good resources and I'm gonna put them in the in the chat now. And thank you. Thank you, that was great. It's a lot to, I think it's a lot to cover. Yeah. So, 
Very good. Thanks for covering it. Appreciate it. Um, all right, Sandra, we'll turn it over to you. Sure. Uh, uh, okay, it's the first time that I will try to share on this new computer. I'm hoping that it will work. Uh, uh, okay, sorry for that. I have to authorize the computer. Uh, okay. Uh, does it work? I'm sorry, I have to leave and to come back because I need to authorize Zoom on my Mac. Okay. Sorry for that. Does anybody know any good jokes? <laughs> uh, it's well, it's funny with this Luber date because I was able to use it in like two instances and it was really basic stuff. It was basically to chop off like the time to get rid of the, the hours and minutes and just give me the date back. But like I can see it being very useful once if you're really familiar with it. Yeah, I mean, I, so, I mean, I, I work in the Midwest and Central Time, and I barely, I mean, I don't think any of my data has that, like where I need to like shift stuff and everything like that. But I'm sure there's certain industries that you need to. Yeah, ours is. I I was talking to a colleague the other day, and um, typically a lot of the the time intervals that we deal with are days. So like air flights are usually over the course of days and, you know, ocean transit is definitely over the course of days or weeks, but there's, there's a study that we might be doing in terms of hours. And so I think the time zone thing is going to get really, really tricky. And we'll have to pay attention to that. And I don't know how, how we're going to do it without our, without somebody keeping track of all the time zones. So. So anyway, that would be interesting. All right, Sandra, we can see your screen now. Okay, yeah, so, yeah, because it's the first time that I use this computer for the Zoom, so yeah. So, and uh, at least it will be far away easier than the date because the date was difficult to understand, I have to say. So pipe. Uh, uh, okay, so basically, I found this one on Twitter and I saw that it was a very good representation on the Enzen to understand the pipe and to say to it just and then something, but it was nice to find this one on Twitter. Uh, so the pipe, the one we know the most is just this one and then it came from my grid. So, and it means that uh, at least we are saving a lot of space because we don't need intermediate step. We don't need to use uh, to find out name for uh, uh, temporary uh, item and it's easier to e read. And something I've learned, it's about to understand the placeholder. Uh, because it's something, it wasn't something I knew before, so I can share with you, is that usually when we do, um, for example, uh, it's for this one, six, uh, the pipe, round pipe digit, because the placeholder is here, so after we can run six, uh, we, um, the digit, six is the digit, uh, and usually, so we can also use twice the placeholder. So the one to five could be used twice. And it's something, um, it's something I wasn't, uh, I didn't have understood at, um, for the pipe that it means that it's like a function with the, the, the placeholder. And so it means also that if we want to do something like that, we just need to know what variable we are using it and to place the placeholder here. And actually, I believe that when we use pure stuff like that, it's interesting. It matters to understand exactly what is doing in the back end. Because what is going in the behind the scene is like that um, the pipe is actually, um, is like writing a, a function. And this function could be something like that. And uh, so it was just that uh, it's an example in, from the book who oh, you can translate this one and actually the pipe is doing that. Uh, so there is case when the pipe won't work and I have to say that I didn't really understand everything. So 
in the book. It is written that it depends it from uh, the function that use current environment like assign won't work with the pipe and function that use lazy evaluation. So what does it mean? Uh, so what is an environment? It's out of the scope of the book, but uh, it means that uh, it's a uh, we, we have the window environment in RStudio, so it's all the collection of objects. And what we have, and it's something I didn't know that every time we define a function, a new environment is created. And now it was making a bit more sense because in some code I have seen, I've seen, you know, uh, have you ever seen this symbol? So it means this symbol is when you assign inside a function, but not as a local variable, but like, um, but uh, as a global variable. So um, it was, okay. So it was, uh, it's not clear for me because it's something I didn't know previously, but it means that because the pipe is actually using a, uh, another function, so it has an own temporary environment. So it doesn't work with function changing environment. So it's not clear at all, that's sorry for that. But anyway, okay. so, and also I didn't know about lazy evaluation. What does it mean? Oh, merde. Okay. Uh, it is what is written, but honestly, I have no idea what that means that uh, when a programming strategies that are assembled to be evaluated only when needed. I don't know, there is an example. And if you look online, it's always the same example, but I haven't understood what it is. So I don't know if you have uh, more information. Uh, somebody might be able to explain it better than I do because I, I came across something the other day that I think helped me to understand lazy evaluation a little bit better. Let me see if I can try to explain it. Um, and if I'm wrong, somebody just slap me down and, and explain it better. But the idea is that um, that you can you can uh, you can refer to a variable name before before it's actually been created. So let's say that um, let's say that you in let's say that in a function like a, you have the the code, but then there's a function that's created, and inside of the function you want to reference the variable why you can do that and you can put it in there and you can refer to it and you can treat it and you can act on it um, even though no value ever gets sent gets assigned to why so it's not going to error out because you're referring to this variable before it's been created before it's actually been created so it's like <clears throat> it's like it'll it'll look at the function and it'll say, okay, you have a function. You're going to use a variable called y. You haven't specified what y is going to be. You're not using it anywhere else. You just have this function and you're using a variable that you haven't created yet, but it's not going to error out because of that. It's going to, it's going to just proceed as though it exists. And it, it, so like, it says like it allows the symbol to be evaluated only when needed. So it's like once it once you finally need that variable y and it's not there, then it'll be a problem, but you can still create the functions as though it was going to exist. I don't know. No, but actually uh, when you look online, there's always one example, the try catch. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So at least uh, I believe that what is really matter to know is that sometimes it won't work. And after it's tough to understand exactly when it doesn't work and why. Yeah. So now there is also other tool in Magrit. We have the T uh, pipe, the exposure pipe, and the other one, I don't know what is their name, is kind of assignment. So we have the T uh, operator. So what he has to uh, what you have to understand is that usually. Uh, the value is the, the right hand. And sometimes you want to keep not the right hand, but the left hand, because you don't have any um, anything here. 
So the example is on plot. It's an example from the book where here you want to plot, but plot doesn't contain anything. So after you can't use this one. So, but if you use the T um, operator, instead at this step, instead of using the value plot, it keep matrix. So after when you use matrix, still you plot, but the value return is here. And after you use this one. So it was just to understand that sometime, if you have uh, some time and uh, you could have, I don't have keep uh, the screenshot, but anyway, it's written that uh, uh, there is nothing. So at least you can think, but it's just when you use plot or print or something like that, that maybe if you use this one, you keep the value from the first, the step just before is what they call the left hand side and the right hand side. And we also have the exposition operator, which make sense for people using base air. Because yes, yeah, this symbol, I, this symbol is a symbol of base air when you want to use vector. So basically you explode. So now you can use, uh, you can use this um, function because this function core is in base air and in base air is used vector. So here, now we can use directly the variable uh, this and MPG from MTK. Uh, and the last one is the one that the book say maybe you should not use. So, uh, so it's uh, this one is an assignment, and we talk several times about the fact that it's really important to put to assign because when we do something like that, it's not saved. So now, if I do that, it means that the variable test doesn't, is not saved. So if I do this test, I have false because test hasn't been saved in empty car. But if we do that, so it means that it will be like using assign and the pipe. Now it's in one step, but uh, it's maybe too fast. And maybe it doesn't, uh, uh, so recommendation is not to use, but at least it's good to know that it exists. So it was so it was a short uh, short presentation about the pipe, and there is no exercise in the book, so it was an easy one. Good, very good. So uh, so this package is named after an artist, Rene Magritte. Who's from? Uh, you think so? Sorry. You think that is because of the artist? I didn't I, I didn't look why they call that Magritte. Yeah, yeah, it is. So th because the the hex, let me see if um, I'm going to share my screen here in a second. Um, uh, almost. Okay. Because my grid is too cheap. I've probably been saying it wrong for a long time. I've, I've always called it Magritter, but that's probably not correct now. So I'm on record <laughs> if, if I'm not correct. Uh, you know, I use French accent, so maybe I'm completely wrong in the way to say something. Huh? Maybe there's multiple pronunciations. I've just been calling it Magritter, so. Yeah. So I'll, I'll share mine. Let's see if this works. Can you guys see like my browser? Ah, uh, yeah, for this painting, okay. So, so the hex, maybe you guys have seen this already, but the, the, the icon in the tidyverse, it's this one or, or this one. Um, and under there it says, Sandra, I'll let you pronounce it because it's in French. Uh, it's be it, because it's from Belgium. So it means that it's a, it was a surrealist. Okay. So it's Magritte. Okay. Yeah. So, how, yeah. So I believe this translates to, this is not a pipe. Yes, exactly. And this was the, this was a, a work of art done by the artist, Rene Magritte, where he said, this is not a pipe. And I think it was just a point of saying- Because this one is a pipe. Well, I think the point of the art was to say, this is not a pipe, this is a depiction of a pipe. This is a painting of a pipe, but this is not a pipe. So maybe he was making some kind of like existential statement about 
you know, art being different than the actual thing. So he says, this is not a pipe. And then, you know, now a hundred years later, we have the tidy verse and they're working on pipes. And so they're like, huh, we'll just use that. We'll borrow the same <laughs> color palette. We'll also put down here, this is not a pipe in French <laughs> and, uh, and off we go. So anyway. It is the same word in English, the, uh, to, the pipe to, to smoke. Okay, okay. I didn't know that it was because for me, because I'm in Alberta, a pipe is a pipeline, it's to oil. Yeah. So. <laughs> so, anyway, so there's a little bit of trivia for you about why, why it's named the way that it is after Rene Magritte. So, that was his, that was his work of art, treachery. Anyway, so there you go. Okay, well, good. That was, I think that was excellent. Has anybody used some of those other pipes before? I've used the T-pipe on occasion um, to send something to the view while I still wanted it to go on to the additional steps of the, of the function. Has anybody I, used anything? I've seen the T-pipe, but um, I don't use plot very much. I mean, can you pass like, like a ggplot object through it and then pipe after that? That's what I was thinking when I was reading through it. I was like, could you like in the middle, put in a GG plot and then go through what else you want to do? I'm pretty sure you can. I've really only used it for view, but yeah, I think you can. If you wanted to, to graph something where I graph something midway through your, through your pipes, you can. Also one time when I used that pipe, it crashed R for me. So the, <laughs> I think it might've been, <laughs> It might have been too much. I don't know. <laughs> uh, I, I, there are so many ways that I've crashed R lately, so I, it's hard to keep track of. And I don't, I, the, the other one, I, I didn't understand it until Sandra explained it, was the, uh, the uh, percent dollar sign. I didn't understand that. And then I was just, then I had to remember how I used to fill in core, right? You'd have to say the data name dollar sign comma data name dollar sign to you know pull it out and then i finally put two and two together i was like oh this makes sense now so yeah it makes sense because it's close to base air when you use the dollar sign a lot and when you use vector not you know it's it's a vectorization of the data frame so it's like so yeah so it makes sense for people knowing base air that uh, yeah but uh, for uh, it, yeah it's a completely different logic it didn't click. It didn't click until you explained it. And I thought the book probably could have like, hey, this is how you usually use core. And then this is how we use it with that new pipe. And then it, it, it clicked when you explained it. So <clears throat> so it, it allows you to specify the data frame and then you don't have to re-specify the data frame. You can just specify the, the variables from the data frame. Is that what it is? Yeah. Yeah, the, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead, Sandra. No, go ahead. Oh. oh, well, I thought, I mean, like, yeah, that's just what it is. Because it took me a while to figure out. We kept saying, like, it it, it explodes out the data name or the, the, the data frame names. And I was like, that doesn't make any sense. Because in my mind, I was thinking, oh, it spits out the names into the console or whatever. But then it's just because when you use core, which is correlation, uh, you usually had to do the data frame and then reference the, the vector or the column that you wanted to use for each, each numeric variable within it. Yeah. But that pipe just allows you to, it's kind of like a shortcut. You don't have to know, you no longer have to reference that date passing it through. And so. Interesting. Very good. I think it would be clear if they did have like a side by side, like, hey, this is how you would normally do it. And then this is how, you know, it, you can do it with this pipe, but. Hit them up on Twitter. Tell them to do it that way. <laughs> yeah, because sometimes you can use also pool to uh, extract. So yeah, it's something uh, I didn't save it, but uh, I play a bit with pool for like that to try to understand exactly what what was happening. But honestly, I will never do correlation like that because uh, yeah, because there is other way to do correlation. That's good. That's good stuff. Anybody else have any other questions or comments about either the pipes or um, or what Maria went over with Luberdate? Our, our time's getting a little bit close here, so. No? 
Well, thank you both very much for all the work that you put in to, to get that. I, I think these conversations are like really amazing because I think for the most part, you can, you can get the sense of what these things do, but until you get somebody to really dive down deep into what they do and all the different aspects of it, it really opens up a lot of, uh, a lot of usefulness. So thank you guys for, for understanding that and sharing it with us. I appreciate it. Um, next week we are on to functions and that, that's still you Colin. Yeah, I can, I can take functions. Okay. Um, it looks like it's a pretty long, it's a long uh, chapter. So feel free to break it up of course. And if you want somebody else to take a, a different half of the following week or whatever, just, uh, you know, just let, let anybody know. I'm happy to jump in as well. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, uh, it will probably spill over into at least two, I would suspect. So, um, but, you know, if somebody, wa if somebody wants to jump in and take half it, you know, just let me know. Send me a Slack message. Okay. Good. Yeah, yeah, just hit Colin up, and then, you, Colin, you decide who does what parts of the chapter, if that works for you. Awesome. Okay, anything else? Are we good? All right. Well, thank you guys again and uh, have a great week. Hit us up and stay in touch on Slack if you have any questions or anything, and we will talk to you next time. Okay. See ya. Bye-bye. Did you get your purr thing figured out, Ryan? Uh, yeah. Yeah, I did. I'm going to save that till maybe um, I may bring it back up in a couple of weeks whenever we get to iterations. Yeah, that's good. I can't remember. I'm trying to find that that blog post that references like the tilde curly bracket, yeah. curly bracket close. I've been trying to find it because I picked that up somewhere a long time ago and I can't remember where I found it. So, but yeah, we'll I'll see. Those. Yeah. I'll find it and see, but yeah, if you got it working, that's yeah. good. Cool. All right. Thanks everybody. Later. Bye.